nice fear online. At least it seems to be. Okay, so... Okay, I hope the sound should be at least not that bad, I would say. So what we're gonna do today is to implement OAuth um, server with resource server using your OpenID Dict framework. It's kind of framework, yeah. So let's start with creating some project. And for sure, we're gonna follow the official RFC documentation while we're gonna implement this because it's kind of protocol, right? And everything is explained and described here. So we're gonna follow this documentation and for sure, open ID, dict samples, and open ID, dict documentation for sure. The problem with OpenID Dict, it is kind of alternative for uh, identity server, most probably you should have heard about the identity server, I think, but it became uh, not free recently, not that recently, but yeah, now you cannot afford it for your commercial projects for free, and there are some other limitations. I'm not sure to be honest, but most of the new projects they are starting using OpenID Dict because I'm not sure. Anyway, I had plenty of experience, not that plenty, but a little bit of experience with OpenID Dict. And it is not well documented, I would say. It is really not really documented at all. I was struggling a lot while implementing it. All you have. Uh, is like those uh, samples and that's it nothing else nothing beyond it so and also openid dict is uh, it is openid connect um, protocol implementation it's not only oauth implementation and there are some differences between them for sure let's go to the documentation of openid connect to the core and there is this is like document official documentation of open id connect protocol which is built on top of oaus as you might know from my articles yeah and for example there is such thing like prompt uh, that exists in um, open id connect protocol but does not exist in oaus context 
So in this particular stream, we are gonna implement um, we're gonna implement particularly OAuth protocol, and we will not touch OpenID Connect in any way because it will take more time, and not everybody needs OpenID Connect. It's like just simple thing, and most probably you will learn a lot of about OAuth and subtle things about OAuth for sure. And uh, one another tricky thing that I was struggling with is that all of those implementations they are pretty much the same. The code is not that easy to read, I would say, and all of the implementations they are OpenID Connect implementations. So they touch OpenID Connect protocol documentation. If you would like to use only OAuth, you can't basically you should patch the code so let's start we have our visual studio here we have our authorization server just to remind you what is OAuth. let's go to particularly my article about this yes for sure my article <laughs> that's for sure and um, now basics there is a lot of definitions we will use them as well and today we are going to implement the most complicated flow or the most complicated grant called authorization code only it because most probably this is what you're going to use it's the most safest the most secure way of doing your OAuth uh, connection I would say, or OAuth implementation things like that so Um, what, is, what, what are we gonna do? Actually, we will have two servers, authorization server and resource server. For now, we have created only authorization server. There are gonna be user agent, which is our Google Chrome. It should be browser and client will lie under the resource server. We will use uh, Swagger UI as a client. We will configure it in the way that it will connect and uh, get the access token from authorization server and use it to call resource server API. So let's start. We can go to the um, like official documentation from what we can start at least to add some basic configure and configure services getting started yeah that's it that's it let's start with basic new bit packages and we will move on um, okay This one is needed, this one needed as well. <laughs> Starcraft is not for today, unfortunately. Unfortunately, Starcraft is not for today. Maybe in the evening we can stream, basically we can stream, I think. If you would play. <laughs> okay, and the G framework. Uh, maybe I'm gonna post it in Instagram as well. Like the link to the stream. Right. Uh, yeah, let me post just link to the stream. While we are stalling, or maybe no, 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 we're not gonna do this. Okay, uh, this thing we don't need. Where's uh, my? Yeah, this one. Okay, so most of the time. You will copy paste all of your scenes from either those samples 
or from the official documentation. And uh, let's do like this. It should be before BL, I suppose. Oh, I don't like those commands. I will command on my own, sorry. <laughs> They're useful if you do it first time. Okay, now I need to be context because OpenID Dict is, Open is going to use uh, your database for the purpose of storing authorizations, tokens, and maybe some other info. To be honest, you don't need to worry about it. Uh, OpenID Dict will take care of this. Application B context. Bam. By the way, we're gonna. Postgres. We're gonna use Postgres for sure because it's my favorite database for now and it, it's free. So uh, we will use Docker for serving. As you can see, I have default port and local instance of Postgres here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we're gonna use Docker Postgres more precisely Postgres inside the docker i already have local server and let me just clean my databases uh yeah let, let, let's clean them boom boom okay that's enough i would say application db context okay and what we're gonna do we're gonna extend from db context Yeah, and one thing we need, we need constructor for B context options. Yeah, this is basically entity framework related things for database, so don't worry about this. Now it should be accessible. Good, 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 good. Set token points. It's not only what we need, actually. And connection string for sure, for sure. Connection. I will just copy paste from my, one of my projects the connection string because it's like uh, really uh, specific per database. So. Yeah, we're gonna use our sample database with root root uh, for Postgres, doesn't matter much. And let's add npg sql, right? npg sql. Bam. This, and most probably we need this one as well. Postgres is in place. Now, default connection, default connection, nice. Okay, we registered application to be context to be used for OpenID Dict. And regarding the endpoints, we should extend this to. It's like that. Okay. Set authorization endpoint URIs, I would say. Connect authorized. It should be. 
Uh, connecting point. What else do we need? Oh, we need logout as well. Set logout. Connect logout. This allows uh, OpenID Dick to use connect logout. I mostly will not talk a lot about OpenID Dick because it requires separate video to to discover what's going on under hood and to analyze somehow the source code and stuff like this. But yeah, yeah. So we're not gonna. Uh, dig deep for the open ID dig explanation. Also, we're not gonna use client credentials for. We're gonna use authorization call flow only. Uh, this is for signing an encryption of the tokens. That's okay. Enable token point pass through. Um, also, we're gonna use. going on with my identification but okay enable authorization endpoint yeah should be okay mm. and we'll go out as well Good enough. Uh, use local server. Good, 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 good. Now, now, no, no, no. Okay, okay, okay. So let's go step by step and continuously add more and more. Um, what we should start from where we should start from authorization code yes we are pretty much interested in this grant and its implementation so this is the basic scheme you can see the same thing but a little bit with more details in my article as well so first thing the client initiates flow by direct resource owners to the entry to authorization endpoint and this endpoint in our case is connect authorize we can go to uh, open id the examples there are a lot of samples with authorization code grant as well authorization code yeah and you basically can see that those implementations of uh, connect authorizing point are pretty much the same uh, for example if you will look, will look like into this one it's pretty much the same as this one you can check later but they are pretty much the same so uh, let's start with this endpoint as well pages no yeah we will need pages later on but now let's start with controllers and for controllers we should register them as well so you know, there services and controllers on. yeah we're gonna use both controllers and rager Razor pages because unfortunately you cannot do your OAuth implementation mainly on poor backend. This is one uh, interesting conclusion I got from reading and learning all of this authorization stuff. You basically cannot do this because of security and because of other different re reasons, especially authentication and stuff like that. It should be done in the same server, meaning that you're gonna throw your HTML here and there and more convenient way is to use Razor pages rather than generating your HTML with anti-reforgery token and stuff like that. So yeah, let's start with adding controller first. And now map Razor pages, map controllers, boom. 
Nice. That's good. Let's create controls then. probably all of those services but um, in most of the samples here they use identity I don't really think we need identity to be honest I don't really think so um, yep uh, so identity is basically used for authentication process and nothing else it has nothing to do with OAuth, to be honest. If we go to RFC documentation and try to look into uh, um, where it is, session grants, I don't know whether it is here or. Okay, 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 okay. Decline and local set. Yeah, here. Authorization server authenticates resource owner via the user agent uh, and establishes where the resource owner grants or denies the client access request. This is what we need Razor pages for. Um, where is exactly our authentication is beyond of scope of this implementation. I remember. I'll find it. Credentials. This one, not this one, not this one. Now, ah, where it is? Here it is. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Let's put it like this. So, authorization point is used to interact with resource owner and obtain an authorization grant. Authorization server must first verify the identity of the resource owner. That, this is what is also called authentication process. So, authorization server should um, verify identity of the resource owner first. But the way in which the authorization server authenticates the resource owner, username, password, session cookies, whatever else, is beyond the scope of this specification. That's it. So, basically, what it means, it means that OAuth doesn't describe in what way you're gonna authenticate your users. And consequently, I can do whatever I want. And in my case, I'm not gonna use identity in any way because it's like it will complicate everything. For our authentication, we will assume that we know who is the user. This is the way. This is the way. <clears throat> Okay, so 
let's move on and where's my cool where's my cool and let's paste this whole method over here this is a little bit complicated i would say if you look at it at first time it's like multiple screen method with a lot of different behavior inside it and we're gonna actually remove most of this behavior here but one thing more we need we need this game destination nice okay so let's start what are we gonna use so in our authorizing point according to the RFC documentation it first needs to uh, must verify identity of the resource owner this is first thing it should do so uh, this one is actually working with prompts and stuff like that i have a little bit another thing to do here so first of all we are trying to get open id so request this request actually contains data which is needed for open id connect and out thing it grabs it from http context so nothing special here now in this scene we gonna uh, we're gonna check whether the user is authenticated in our application and if it's if it's not we're gonna redirect uh, the user to authentication endpoint this is the plan but it also interacting with prompts which are not in scope of OAuth, it's in scope of uh, open IT connect and also it uses identity constants we're gonna use just plain cookies and we're gonna assume that we know the user and we will just put one claim called user id inside it and we'll read from the cookies this claim this is how our authentication gonna work so 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 uh let's 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 go to to particular controller okay so and also a lot of prompts okay first of all what we're gonna do we assume that the user is gonna be maybe he is already authenticated we're gonna check this using our cookies of the ah, by the way we need to add authentication authentication uh, cookie authentication cookie authentication defaults scheme yes this one uh, add cookie boom yeah let's put exactly the name of the scheme and here we're gonna use our authentication as well so in authentication we're gonna use only cookies that's it how it works i already explained in my article here how basically cookies works in dotnet so you can go through it and treat okay <clears throat> and now we're gonna get our user from cookies how we can do that easily speak on text authenticate async and authenticate through cookie authentication default scheme why it is important to specify it because OpenID Dict also introduces its own scheme called sign in called OpenID dig server aspnet core defaults authentication scheme this is the scheme which we're gonna use for to to represent that user have granted have granted particular access to particular scope and this gonna basically represent 
this authentication is going to represent this user authorization basically and uh, and our cookies scheme is going to represent our um, authentication so open id dict scheme authentication scheme for representing authorization that particular user granted something to something and our scene to represent that user actually authenticated hello 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 my call hey. uh, by the way i would be really appreciate if you share this stream with some guys because I haven't heard about anything such thing that I'm doing right now. Like nobody really cares about when I did it. Everybody silently make their things work and that's it. It's fair, Titan like this. That's why we're streaming here. So okay. Uh, we got the result. And for sure it could be the first connect authorize request from the browser and from the user. Which actually means uh, that we should challenge the user to authenticate him and by the user i mean resource owner this is that line inside the documentation authorization server must first verify the identity of resource owner that's it so we're gonna verify it but in what way uh, in what way in what way we're gonna check expiry of of the cookies and basically the result of authentication. For that reason, we're also gonna do a lot of different scenes uh, related to authentication and authorization. I will decouple them in series called Auto House Service. This is just plain class where we will implement everything. I will not even create interface for this thing. I'll just register it as here. Builder services at let's say transient. Most probably it will contain some functions <laughs> just for testability. We will decouple it. And in this service, we're gonna check uh, whether the particular um, authenticate result in particular open id request context is valid or not this is what is actually happening here it gets uh, authentication result from identity scheme but since we're not going to use identity we will use our own one it's simpler and then it checks what the result is succeed blah 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 prompts we're not going to use at all so we're not going to use prompts and it checks also that uh, it is still valid so the cookies are not expired by the time um, basically here and uh, also this is thing with prompt we're not gonna bother ourselves with it also prompt we're not gonna bother ourselves with it it grabs the parameters uh, it is done to create redirect uri which we which the resource owner will be redirected after it it is authenticated we will see later on but <coughs> for now let's just decouple our our service is this one so it will be public boolean by the way we are inside microsoft right now Nicola, thank you we're inside microsoft right now yes i'm spending here my weekends because office is really great this is like for atmosphere for you to know okay is house uh, house yeah thank you uh, what we're gonna use here is authenticate result uh, 
and open my detect request. Now how are we gonna call this service? gonna use it in this way or is authenticated bam our service is authenticated and here we put the result and request good 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 and this is authenticated we're gonna decouple all the behavior with checking expiry with checking the result and stuff like that so this I will just drop let's move here so first of all if our house uh, authenticate result is is not succeed then we definitely return false because this is the this is the case where a resource owner doesn't even have cookies set so in this case we just return it. it's not authenticated and we're gonna prompt login password screen for it nice Then, uh, if still we have our CTK result valid, we still gonna implement the cookies expiry behavior. Uh, how we gonna do that? If the request uh, max age, this request comes from OpenID Dict, has value and because it's nullable, yes, yes. And if our syndication result properties is not null as well. And this one can we use has value? No, we can't. Okay, leave it as it is. Max age seconds. Max age seconds. Boom. We will calculate how for how long in seconds um, cookies are gonna leave from OpenID request which is most probably configurable but for now it's it's like it's it's a detail and let's calculate whether it is expired or not Okay, in this scene we are checking whether the result has issued UTC time. It's the time where when cookies were issued for the source owner or for just for this for this particular whoever it is. And we are checking basically the delta of the time and if it's more than max age seconds then the cookies should be considered as expired. And if so we return false for sure, otherwise we return true. Nice. Not all. Ah, yeah, 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 sorry, sorry, this, this one. Nice. And we're gonna use this one here, okay, it's authenticated, and I'm gonna drop all of those things. Parameter um yeah we will talk about it a little bit later but for now no 
stream, by the way. Let me really share the stream. Um, just a moment. Boom. Sure, copy link. Yeah, I just will put stories in my. posted yeah nice works sorry for that okay and here if, if we are not our syndicated we're gonna prompt our challenge but not for identity constants because as far as I like, three times I already said it we're gonna use our cookie scheme registered in startup and redirect you arrive we'll use later on and let's talk about parameters so whenever we got connect um, authorize call from the of their client we're gonna get some parameters either from query or from form it could be both because message should accept both HTTP post and get according to documentation uh, yeah, and point here I may include form uh, URL encoded. It's basically uh, this one, or it could contain query component as well. So we're gonna pretend that client can do whatever he wants, it wants. And so to parse those parameters, um, let's decouple it as well. I would say let's decouple it here. Yeah. So let's put it in our same house service and public IP. We'll just parse from whatever we have from HTTP context here. So parse house. So no matter how we get those parameters, we will pass them here. Basically, excluding parameter is not really required here because we're not gonna get prompt parameter in scope of OAuth. What we can do, we can just ignore it at all because it's not open ID connect. We're gonna implement only OAuth and there is nothing to said about this prompt parameter inside OAuth documentation. Oh. And, uh, but for the future, maybe I will stream with open ID connect OAuth protocol implementation using open ID dict as well on top of the OAuth and then we will use it. So for now let's leave it, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's copy paste it. Basically, HTTP context request. Boom. Just like this. And for excluding part, we will just gonna use 
where uh, excluding contains excluding does not contain actual parameter parameter key I would say yes yes key here and we're gonna do to dictionary to dictionary right right yeah string string values bomb That much readable, I would say. Looks better, right? Okay, so here what we did. We just parse parameters either from queries or from form and we return them because we're gonna use it later on. Good. And here regarding the parameters. we don't need anything right now once we have this those parameters uh, what we can do actually we're gonna create a re redirect URI based on those parameters uh, because once uh, we got challenged here and once we the resource owner is authenticated on this step using our cookie scheme it will be redirected straight away to disconnect authorize and what we not gonna do we not gonna forget all parameters that were passed in the first request that's why we're gonna preserve it using redirect URI. that's basically how it works in OAUS uh, yep and we're gonna use the same redirect URI on consent form That's why I would like to decouple this message as well. Uh, so here, yes. Uh, gonna return just string. Build a direct URL. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. We're gonna build it from HP request for sure, and our parameters that we have parsed from the request before. And basically, the URL will be simple.
and return it straight away. Be all serious, build redirect your bomb. Cool. From HP con HP con text and parameters. Okay. And at this point, if we are not all syndicated yet, we don't have any cookies, we're gonna show Razor Pages uh, HTML to allow user to add the email and stuff like that. What I would like to say about this, um, whenever I was trying to read those OpenID samples, I was really unhappy about the non-existence of separation of um, client and server. Basically for me it was confusing to understand that authorization server cannot be basically easily at least decoupled to client or server. You cannot have your separate Angular authorization server, beautiful forms, and then do all the stuff on the backend. You can't do this because of security. We will talk about it later whenever we implement everything. It is also mentioned in RFC documentation somewhere below. Security considerations are like these are how many 16 reasons why you cannot do this. And so the option for you to keep it is in plain backend would be something that I have already kind of implemented in my samples for sure. Like I, previously I implemented it, implemented this OAUS to not be stupid all the stream right <laughs> and to show actually something valuable. Uh, so I can show you this one. So one way how you can do this, you can create some controller which is basically poor backend thing, and you can authenticate inside pure backend as well, uh, like email, password, stuff like that, and sign in using cookies scheme. Everything will work. And for displaying, you can just generate HTML. It's kind of a hack that will work. But one thing is the security consideration is um, like this CRF, how it's called, CSRF, yeah, yeah, this, oh, sorry, forgery attack or something, how it's called, cross-site request forgery, yes, 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 this, this one. And uh, for this one, you basically need anti forgery token, which is uh, by default is used for Razor Pages and I would say for MVC applications as well, when, whenever you create form. And with this one, you will need to create your own anti forgery tokens and check them all as well. So it's like overhead. You should test it, you should ensure it works and stuff like this. Basically how it works, as far as I know, they preserve this token in cookies and then they check from the HTML, from the hidden input that, okay, this token is the same as in cookie, most probably this is the same user is trying to submit this form. So basically with some hacks, maybe it's possible to keep it in poor backend, but I would say it is more convenient to use Razor Pages plus backend. Or another thing that I have seen in samples, uh, it is pretty interesting. Authorization code, uh, demo core, no, 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 maybe this one. Uh, this guy implemented everything inside inside Razor Pages, basically. Uh, Yes, this is Contrum. Contrum. Yeah, Conform as this Razor Pages and Druhare. So basically, you can do everything inside your Razor Pages, like authorize some point, And basically, you can see all the same copy pasted stuff that we have seen before. I then not copy pasted, yeah, with some changes, but still, like this part is, I would say, the same for all of the samples. They are just 
copy pasting it all the time. I don't like it basically. It's not that much readable at least this scene. I don't like it. But anyway, uh, you can for consistency implement everything in the pages as well, but I would like to have like this separation for backend as well. So we're in the challenge step and this step we're gonna authenticate our user mm. for this one let's create our phone not class or oh, we're not interested in class let's raise our pages and we will name it something called authenticate let's say very nice one note, please. Uh, remember, you don't want to forget to add this add tech helper and stuff like this. Otherwise, your form will not work properly and sometimes you will lose your binded data. And this is the problem. So, um, don't forget it. If you don't didn't create from the scratch pages with all of these setup templates and you just add added folder pages and the first page don't forget to add this scene like here don't forget it but since i'm using view imports and it will be imported everywhere okay so since i'm not front end there right I cannot write proper HTML and we're not gonna do this uh, in this particular um, it's called guide and no stream I'm gonna copy paste already made thing and basically it's pretty much simple this is used for discoverability you would like to know what is going on in your model basically you can drop it you don't need it but let's leave to for, for the demo purposes and then uh, another scene you just generate regular form and submit your email and password and here we'll have public async on post async and we're gonna accept those email and password here and do authentication with this particular method. After authentication, we will sign in using our cookies. And after that, our authorization server will have authentication cookies for resource owner that we can use. We will use it and do our authorization according to OAuth protocol. Um, okay. Now let's go to our model and here for sure we have st string email as our like login then password yeah then uh, one thing we need bind property bind property uh, is the uh, return URL this is actually what we have called redirect URA so far we will receive it on get here string return URL and return URL return URL that's how we preserve it in our model and bind property is used for these purposes to have our return URL uh, whenever we're gonna on post a async and do our scene because uh, after we sign in uh, user with cookies we're gonna redirect us back to our authorization controller. Okay, here we return just page. For that we're gonna show the result. Nice. And apart from return URL, we're gonna maybe use public string our status. Just for discoverability what's going on maybe show some message stuff like that doesn't matter much you can omit it and now basically our syndication process in real examples in real applications you're gonna call here something like identity user manager 
like uh, find user by email, check passwords, ensure that user really exists in your database and stuff like that. But for our purposes, OWASP protocol doesn't have anything for uh, for 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 the uh, verifying the identity of resource owner process. So we can do on our own. And in my case, I will create just some constants. Let's name it just email and password. Let's say this is our database, like database, and this is our only identity information about our user in plain in play state. Or in plain view, and our resource owner gonna have email called email dot email dot com and password with name password doesn't matter much. And here, what we're gonna do, we're gonna accept email and password, and just do straight forward checking like if email is equal is not equal to const email or passwords I go to passwords then we return um, now status not authenticate let's say something like this and we return just page like it's no valid password good now if uh, the user pasted the correct credentials. We're gonna create claims principle. This is basic, uh, teeny bag of information about identity of the user. So I mean, some claims like email and no information, birthday, name, ID, whatever you want. And we're gonna sign it, uh, sign this principle and this identity to. Uh, Yes, yes. Okay. I'm not sure maybe how it was with the sound. I'm not sure, but okay. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Now, uh, claims first. And our claims, we're gonna create just new claim with claim types email, and we're gonna just paste our email which we got that we got from the user input. Now let's create principal claims principal bam. claims. Yeah, and new claims cookie house. Okay, this is our principle which contains only one client's identity with those claims that are basically only email. And then we're gonna call we're gonna call HTTP contact sign in async and sign in our to our using our authentication scheme with cookies and this particular principle. I have already described in my article what will happen after this call. Basically uh, under hood it will create the cookies encrypted most probably 
put all the claims inside the cookies and return these cookies uh, using set cookies header I would say and preserve those cookies between the calls so next call we will have this particular cookies with our principal and our user okay and then uh, if our return URL is not empty we just redirect to it oh. yes and if not our status uh, authenticated just authenticated but not redirected so I'll just show the page I think that's okay okay this is our page for for authentication process after that we will go to this redirect URL and we will get to the same basically it will be ignored anyway yes and we will be authenticated after that stage because at this point we will have all the cookies needed and that's good okay uh, so Now, what's gonna happen next? This is copy pasted code from sample, open edict. What it does, it tries to retrieve user from the storage. Since we don't have user manager because we don't have identity, we drop this. Our user uh, in four is already in constant, uh, constants, no, const, consts class, yes. That's it, so we don't need it. It retrieves application from the uh, from the database. This is already OpenID dict scope. Before that, let's create the client. By the way, um, I usually yeah, let's create something called Cedar, uh, right? Client Cedar, maybe. So to be able to interact with our clients, OpenID Dict is gonna create and store those clients, right? This is the process whenever you're gonna use OAuth from Google or from uh, Facebook, GitHub, whatever. You should first register your client with appropriate client ID, client secret, maybe, and return URL or redirect URL. And yeah, this is required for security and general behavior purposes, especially to have redirect URL, client ID and client secret. This is needed for security. We will talk about it later. It is described in RFC as well. So what this client is either gonna do um, on the startup, we're gonna just drop all the clients and initialize them and populate our database with them. So, we need service provider to resolve everything. Because most usually all repositories DB contexts are scoped. And in our startup we will not have any scope, so we're gonna create our own one. This, yeah, 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 nice. Allow visuals here. Yeah. Public async task add scopes. Boom. Now let's create our scope, and by scope I mean uh, there are our resource server API scope. I'm not sure. Basically, do we have uh, scope? S uh yeah tokens represent specific scope and duration of access that's great it is still according to rfc so what we're gonna do we're gonna register our scope to make it storable and to not allow everybody just to put whatever scopes they want and we're gonna accept the required scopes from the client and put those scopes into the token and then our resource server 
will be able to validate that okay this token has appropriate scope meaning the user has access to this scope and whatever this scope is representing like i don't know so let's create this one um, but okay maybe maybe not now first of all we need to create our client we will uh, go back to our scopes in the step of creating resource server add clients so wait using our scope service provider bomb create async scope boom First of all, let's ensure that our database is created. Uh, yeah. This scene will apply, as far as I know, this scene will create a database and apply all the migrations, but I'm not sure, to be honest. Okay, then, 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 let's retrieve our manager. Up. Up. Mm -hmm. Open ID, dict, application manager, exactly this one guy. And our client. Let's name it web client. It doesn't mean anything, just put a unique identifier that can represent your OAuth client. In our case, it will be just web client. So between the calls, there could be a situation where we already have that client in our database and to quickly be able to debug and change different bit of information from web client, I will just between the startups of the application, I will just drop all the database and create it, drop all the data from database and create it and populate it from the scratch again. So if client not null, meaning that it is in database, what we're gonna do, we're just gonna delete it, delete it. Because we're gonna create it in the next step. Okay, and in that case, let's go and copy paste from somewhere. They have those, uh, how it's called, worker. Yeah, it's background service for some reason, but I don't need the hosted service. So this we're gonna copy paste, yeah. Boom. Good, so our client gonna be not MVC, but web client. Uh, client secrets, any secret information. Basically, you don't want to populate it like this row, uh, put it in configuration and read from environment variables. It is the good approach, but this is only sample and proof of concept, so we don't care. So, our web application doesn't matter much. Okay, and now redirect URLs. How are we going to do that? Uh, our particular application is hosted using Kestrel on port 7273. I'm gonna change to 7000. Our, um, how it's called, our resource server that we will create later on, the server that will just validate the token issued by this authorization server, it will be on 7002. We will create it in the way it is 7002. Uh, this redirect URI is needed uh, for security reasons because otherwise uh, some malicious code could put whatever redirect URL it wants to the to the authorization server, 
and it will redirect authorization code to this redirect URL. It's not that good. So at each uh, step, whenever you have authorization code grant, uh, authorization server should compare the return and redirect URL from the client with this one it has in database. That's why whenever you register your client in Google, GitHub, Facebook, Microsoft, whatever else provider you want, it gonna prompt you uh, with to provide the redirect URI on client registration. Basically, you cannot register your client without the redirect URI because of this security reason. And for the permissions, okay. Uh, regarding permissions is what will be allowed in endpoints. Uh, regarding the permissions, OpenID Dict has some documentation even, as far as I remember, configuration, uh, per application permission, that's it. Yeah, endpoint permissions, grant time permissions, scope permissions, you can read about it here. I already done it, it's nothing that much complicated uh, application it will control and limit in your features for this client so basically what it means if you don't have this permission here your client will not be able to uh, have authorization or your client will not be able to have scope profile in that case and stuff like this so we're gonna add one more permission permission for our scope that we will create a little bit later and this scope will represent our resource server api and nothing else so what we're gonna do uh, permissions prefixes scope ap1 let's name it api1 it's just name of you, you can put whatever name you want it's the name of scope and this scope will represent access to our resource server that's what you need to do to know and regarding requirements we're not gonna use proof of or proof key or pkce uh, because it is complicated and it will be harder to explain for you what is going on in our demos so we will put it out we will use client id in secret good and this we will call from from where from after our application is built Ah, okay. Okay, create scope. Nice. Okay, it's very important to have this call first because this call ensures database is created. This is very important thing for us. If it's not, then those calls will be failed. And if we, you're gonna add scopes, and in add scopes you will not call ensure create async, then you will get an error that database does not exist. I think it's pretty much easy to understand. Good. Uh, let's go back here. This is how we get our application. Basically, this object will contain all the information we have specified, almost all of, all of the information we have specified in this client. For the user ID, we already have one. This is our user ID. I already told that we don't have any authentication, a complicated one. We we are pretending that we know everything here. 
okay we got applications i mean application and then we try to get authorizations and in this step it's kind of all of those samples they are built in the way of OpenID Connect. But since we don't need our like OpenID Connect, uh, we're gonna do something else at this point. There is one thing about OAuth protocol that apart of uh, verifying user identity, there is one required thing that authorization server should do. It should uh, verify that resource owner really allowed access of particular client and um, yeah 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 so this is our flow authorization code grant according to RFC documentation um, the authorization server authenticates the resource owner and establishes where the resource owner grants or denies the client's access requests basically somebody else in the office like it's saturday guys why are you here <laughs> and um, so we need to ensure that the resource owner really grants the access for the client and for this one we're gonna create another page called consent Nice. Um, and what is the plan? At this stage, this scene we're not gonna use anymore because it uh, works with OpenID Connect stuff, like consent stuff like that. We're not interested in it at all. In OAuth, there is no any definition of explicit systematic consent types and everything like this. Uh, but one thing we will do, we will. Um, serve the consent form where the user can confirm that it um, that it allows like the resource owner can uh, confirm that it allows this particular client to access its data and this is done here by view because the sample is using MVC we're not gonna use it we're gonna use uh, razor pages so we drop this one from here <laughs> And after we got the application, what is this? This redundant one. <sighs> what are the ways that you can preserve con granted consent between the calls from the user? So, for now, to explain your situation, at this point, you have your user authenticated. So, in the system, the server knows that user is who it is claimed to be so we verified this user really exists in our database now we would like to get the confirmation from this user that he allows this client to use his data and this consent is kind of true false it could be represented like true false either grant or not grant access and since we are in context of uh, API right now we don't have session in for or something like that because it's stateless and it should be like this you don't want to change it the API should be as stateless as possible we can go to our constant form and serve the constant form okay let's say user clicked some button called grant access right how we gonna redirect to our connect authorize and preserve information about granted or denied access and to read this information in this api it could be done basically by some query parameter by header or something like that but it's not that secure because uh, i don't know whether we can but most probably we cannot in poor api to use anti-forgery tokens why it is needed because of 
and this attack that could be like CS CSRF yeah yeah like this one cross side request forgery how it is done in the OpenID implementation this is the interesting thing how they did it if we go to this to this sample by Lucia server sample how it is done here let's go to authorization controller okay uh, we got some constant type doesn't matter much the point where we serve constant view model is here constant form authorize view model we pass some scopes application name doesn't matter much let's go to use and see what happens here we serve all of the information parameters that we got and serve accept deny buttons then what we have we have our authorization controller and they added two more endpoints with the same pass as connect authorize, authorize endpoint but they added validate anti forgery token so anti forgery token was added on this stage with authorize, authorize view model which we cannot afford ourselves because like like we cannot afford ourselves to serve the razor page and then uh, it will contain by default the uh, anti forgery token but then we cannot validate it because we have poor api we don't have mvc we have poor stateless api and it's like good decision i would say so we cannot validate anti forgery token and it allows uh, some security uh, things to happen to our application so the workaround for me here like there are multiple workarounds right you can uh, uh, you can basically on the constant form processing on post you can preserve this information inside the database and read this information here whenever you will be redirected you can just like are granted read from tp by i don't know by user id and check whether user really granted it and then the forgery token will be validated on this public void on post here it will be validated by default Another thing uh, how you can do this is by doing everything that is done in this endpoint whenever the user accepted it we can execute the same behavior set claims blah 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 create new authorization uh, save it into database and then just sign in with OpenID dig server smart core defaults and it will issue that like the tokens and everything will be fine at this point we will be signed in it will be pretty much secure and stuff like that but the problem here is that constant form is located by another address it is located by slash constant road and if we try to execute this one by this road we will get null reference exception basically we will get invalid operation exception because this get get open id dig server request is allowed only in the token endpoint authorize endpoint logout endpoint and all endpoints that we have configured in program cs not here in startup right where is it yeah on those endpoints so actually this leads us to one problem we cannot afford ourselves to do everything in constant form so another workaround that i was thinking about is just okay let's say we have authentication cookies and it already contains our email claim that we have put it on the authentication process we can just put another claim that will represent granted access for the client 
and since we have only one client it's okay right now I think for the extendability we can put more claims I think uh, but for now it seems like workable solution so what I actually su suggest we can let's basically go to our implementation and I will mm, explain meanwhile Okay, so we have our <coughs> constant model. We're also gonna have here a string ret return URL because we're gonna if if user didn't grant our access for the client, we will do pretty much the same. We will redirect user to constant screen. Uh, to ensure that uh, it grants particular access so that's why we need then return URL to go back to connect authorize and now have have this uh, grant uh, I mean consent granted we're doing we're doing pretty much the same bind property on get we're gonna uh, Gonna accept the um, return URL. Go on. Now okay. Now let's add the HTML. So our form will be pretty much uh, easy to understand. It's just form with two buttons, deny and access, uh, deny and grant. Let's add those values here. Grant and consequently deny. Yeah, those will be the values. Mm. Okay, and once the form will be submitted, we will get um, the particular value, either this one or this one, in our parameter in Razor Pages. And then we can basically easily check if grant is not equal to cons grant access and we return for beat like user is didn't didn't give any and didn't provide any grant for the client ID so client ID is not allowed to do whatever it wants with resource server otherwise we're gonna try to get constant claim from the uh, from the user and to ensure that we have claims principle here we put authorize attribute with uh, cookies here authentication defaults so to be able to get this screen for constant user should be already uh, authenticated in our system so user or resource owner should already have uh, had uh, authentication cookies and now what we're gonna do we're gonna try to get claim uh, related to consent let's name it consent claim and if this claim uh, if this claim is not given before like user can access this screen multiple times even if he already granted access before or or even if he already denied this access before so if this string like this claim um, if it is empty that means 
that user haven't gotten and haven't provided any consent before so we can uh, for sure add this new claim which will indicate that user uh, provided uh, granted access for particular client so we put here our const constant naming to be like on the same on the same key and we gonna put our grant which is actually grant access value okay now we have our uh, claims principle with new claim indicating user provides a necessary grant and what we're gonna do we're gonna we're gonna put these new created user claims into the cookies once more So we basically just override the existing cookies with new claim. Everything stays the same, but now these cookies, cookies authentication defaults, represents both values. One, it represents the user itself and identity of the user, and second, it represents the given grant from the user. That's very important. Now we can read both of those values and decide what to do on connect authorized step. After that, we just return redirect to our return URL. <coughs> Looks okay for now, I would say. And after this, this stage is authenticated, it's in place, that's good. After this is authenticated, what we can do uh, we can actually get uh, var consent claim since this endpoint should should contain user by that step if the result is successful it means that yeah this result contains principle uh, so we get this principle from the result authentication result and try to get our grant claim more precisely constant uh, claim and if constant claim is not equal to grant access value meaning that user before didn't put didn't provide grant uh, like didn't accept didn't allow uh, the client to be used and to use resource owners data then we just return for bit most probably or uh, also it could be that this constant claim is empty in that case we just uh, generate the constant form to allow user to allow uh, this client to use resource owner data so we build the return url once more encoding it in uh, url encoding I will explain later why. constant URL which is constant name because of razor pages uh, naming conventions with return URL query parameters return URL I'm not sure is it the best way to generate URL most probably no but for our purposes it's enough and we just return a direct URL with our constant direct URL that's it and if 
by this step we just guarded ourselves to provide a client um, any um, any privileges and any accesses to resource owners data uh, before the resource owners before the resource owner actually allows it to do this after that after this stage so we have our grant from the resource owner we can actually issue the token now Okay. And for now, uh, let's have our user ID that we set in our cookies uh, by the email claim type. Claim type. Claim types. Email. That should have this value. This is our user ID. Let's select this. Uh, in real cases, most probably you will have some uh, GUID, most probably. After that, what we're gonna do, we're gonna create identity that we will sign in into OpenIDDict scheme. Uh, but, and also on top of that, we're gonna create authorization uh, in scope of the OpenIDDict to preserve authorization information and to not prompt user each time. Basically, for now, it will not work in like that, but for future OpenID Connect implementation, it will help us because like for this one, we will remember the constant of user and uh, depending on prompt provided from the according to OpenID Connect documentation, we will either generate constant form or not. And to not generate constant form each time uh, your application or your client is gonna to access resource owner's information, open edict sold it in uh, in the way of storing authorizations. So let's first create identity. And it gonna be token validation parameters default authentication type this one i just copy pasted from the sample so yeah basically this one is really copy pasted from the from this sample okay nice i'm back here <laughs> because i'm not the single one in the office unfortunately <coughs> is happening here like after all the constants are provided yeah this is what is going to happen uh, yeah this one in the stage whenever we have either authorizations or um, the user don't want to provide the constant but this is only in case of open id connect in our case we just ensure that user granted access for client and then we can safely sign in using the open id dick scam uh, do not uh, like uh, misuse them open id dick scheme is the scheme for providing access tokens and identity tokens i already checked the source code how it does it uh, and it, it, it has nothing in common with our cookies scheme and our cookies like our authentication and grant cookies, uh, OpenID Dict has its own cookies and own management separately for the authorization. So those are different. Let me just copy paste from the sample and refactor it a little bit. So for our subject email name role, let's just put everything as our user ID. 
but in real example you will get this info from your database most probably from the identity as the most popular scene for authentication in .NET world most probably and let's put some regular user admin roles you can put just empty one doesn't matter much we are putting here scopes uh, to our identity uh, basically we put everything from the request but in real world example you can have uh, the allowed scopes from the client or like you can validate it on these steps for example to provide not on the scopes but provide some subset of those scopes up to you oh i need async link i think for this one to work Manage new get packages, bam. Okay, nice. Uh, now we set resources this is this is also related to scopes we will talk about it later and then what is going to happen next uh, yes we set scopes and resources and then we gonna query our applications application this one Ah, okay, so now we're gonna query our authorizations to check whether there are any existing ones. Basically, this step actually is not needed to preserve authorization, I guess. But in OpenID Connect scenarios later on, we will definitely need it. So for now, let's create authorization whenever we got. Um, whenever we got successful sign-in as well so we try to get existing authorizations for this user uh, is permanent there is like valid status and for this particular application we're gonna get the last one and if there is no uh, such authorization so this authorization is null meaning authorizations are empty we're gonna just create new one so identity we will put like our identity which is uh, with this one that we will put in sign in for the open edict cookies and tokens subject is user id client is we put here authorization types permanent to not um, bother user with constant screen all the time that 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 is the reason basically And scopes in this authorization I'm gonna put all scopes we have in our identity get scopes boom okay at this point new authorization will be created we set authorization ID destination stuff like that oh, okay for destinations I really don't like it like for me this code looks really not consistent so I put this one into authorization service and I simplified it a lot so let's 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 put it here as well public static list three get destinations about the destinations we have also uh, 
describe them in the documentation here. Basically, by default, uh, OpenIDD does not put all the claims into the token, so you should specify specifically what claims you would like to put into your token to allow your resource server to read. That's nice. Uh, it works in uh, like just as a lambda expression. So you put some claim and you decide based on this claim where it could go. So it is pretty much complicated behavior because it also includes identity token generation, which does not exist in scope of all. So you can just ignore all identity token cases and simplified version uh, will look something like this. If claim type is open ID dict constants destinations uh, sorry climbs name constants claims name why we don't have name you know we have so if if claim type name or or Claim type is open id dict constants claims email. Only in this case, we put those claims into access token. So we should add constants des destinations access token. Go. So only those two types will go to access token and it will allow from resource owner to resource owner to read those claims. And yeah, sure we return destinations. For me it looks more consistent and prettier than this one we have in utilization. So we will drop this one, I don't like it at all. Yes, and here we use authorization service, or how it's called, our service. Yeah, and put it like a lambda like expression. Good, good. We're almost done with authorization. And at this point, we uh, sign in our identity that we have generated with granted access with user id with everything we need using open ID dick server as that core defaults authentication scheme do not confuse this one and 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 and, and this one this one for authentication and granted denied access this one for authorization and everything related to OpenID Dict. This is important to differentiate. After this scene, according to RFC documentation, we will get code for our into our redirect URL. And we will have our authorization code, which we gonna exchange with authorization server. And uh, Yes, yeah, so authorization code, code where is token? Sir, uh, client authorization code makes request to exchange token. Yeah, this is the fifth step. We exchange code and get the token for the code. And we're gonna implement this one as well. <coughs> okay, so. We post. Uh, Okay, exchange. In this case, we can actually rely to existing, uh, how it's called, existing samples and just copy paste most of the behavior. Exchange. This one, yeah, 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 long one. Actually, what I realized that 
my scene works without anti-forge token in pure api we don't have one and application json as far as i know it is by default uh, generated with this a mime type if you're using your api controller which we don't use here here API controller yeah this one good now we are getting a request we only allow authorization code and refresh token ground type nothing else we are trying to authenticate and to recall you what authenticate means authenticate means to grab particular principle and user data including id email whatever is put in claims and to check whether this information is valid and whether we have it and whether like getting of this information is successful most usually this one will be got from uh, there is set of filters and handlers inside the source code of open id dict and most probably this one it will get the result from the cookies i think since we know our user and authentication is not gonna be like that we are just gonna get our user with uh, let's simplify it a lot uh, if request not or request is not and request is not we just return throw new in valid should have one and this one okay simplified a lot already then we got our result nice and our user id our user id result principal get claim get claim claims subject and we put this subject for you to remember here <coughs> subject is pretended to be our real user id not the email but in our case those are the same nice and now um if our user ID is string is null or empty, just throw for bit because at this point the user definitely should be authenticated whenever it tries to get token. Can sign in, let's pretend it can. We don't have sign in manager. Now, after that, it generates the same like identity like principal claims name role it sets the claims again which we will do in the same way we did here the same exactly way boom we are setting destinations using our service get okay, destinations boom and we are signing in it again and this will ask OpenID to issue appropriate access and identity tokens. In what way? Like you can, you can be confused uh, because if you do the same with cookies authentication scheme, what it does, it will do uh, just creating cookies, and uh, it return response. It returns response with set cookies header, which will set your cookies into the browser. But this one inside the code i uh, i have looked into the source code of open id dict so inside the code what it does it has a chain of handlers and filters and those handlers they know whenever the request is token whenever the request is connect whenever the request is log out and based on it uh, it will issue access token and you write uh, application slash json mime type with access token expiry time scope and stuff like this <coughs> nobody is watching i suppose three watching now nice and twitch just one ha okay doesn't matter much now at this stage and this step 
we have our token issued now let's have logout endpoint as well we can basically copy paste it from here as well like logout logout boom and simplify it a little bit so no action name validate and forge token i don't think we need because it's like safe operation most probably i'm wrong i should check the security information about it but i think that logout is safe operation okay we log out user not be able to access and most probably malicious code cannot do anything i guess but i'm not sure and in this case, as you can see, they are using sign-in manager provided from identity. But since we don't use identity, our identity is our cookies. So what we're gonna do, we're just gonna do this one. HTTP context, sign out, cookie, authentication default scheme, and that's it. So we're signing out our cookies that are representing user identity and user grant. Like, like that user allowed client to access resource owner data its own data basically and we also are signing out from open Dig server uh, authentication scheme as well that's it from the authorization server perspective let's try to create a resource owner new project uh, web app API basically OAuth resource server bump and actually there is not that many samples of open hello Roman cuckoo <laughs> there are not that many samples of open id dict uh, that are representing separated resource server and authorization server because there is no such defined rule how it should be implemented so authorization server and resource server could lie on the same physical machine even on the same port uh, meaning they are the same application and still they are like authorization server and resource server and if you see take a look into Velusia server it's basically what is happening this server has resource control which is actually resource with authorized uh, attribute which is protected attribute and also authorization controller in most of the cases this is what you would like to do this is what you don't you're not how it's called you wouldn't like to do yes you wouldn't like to do like this because if you're using our server i think i really pretend that most probably you're having some distributed systems maybe microservices whenever you would like to keep your resource server separate from authorization server this is this is the also purpose like logical separation of those there are some samples but they are not that easy and um, client server no 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 yeah this is like api resource and this is the authorization server so those are separated we're gonna separate it as well because to make it in one uh, solution you have uh, plenty of samples but to make it separate physically, like physical applications, there are not that many samples. And as I told on the client seeder, we're gonna use 7002 port for our resource server. So let's put it the same way. And now what we're gonna do, we're going to add our nuggets. Packages, bam. First one for validation. Another one for validation as well. Uh, 
and one thing for swagger i'm not sure maybe we already have it yeah we already have it cool cool now no what we are going to do um yes yes this api is using client secret client id and what's called introspection way of uh, of enabling resource server to validate particular token so how, how it works resource server and our authorization server should know about each other resource server can be standalone so in some way resource server should be able to validate particular access token so with this one authorization controller we issued particular access and maybe refresh tokens access token is used is going to be used by a client to be able to request the resource server did i explain somewhere yeah yeah so this one on this stage you got the access token and you go with this token to resource server a resource server should be able in some way to check that this access token is valid and it can provide resource owners data there are mainly two ways how to do that in OpenID connect samples. One way is to use introspection, and, but there is another way. Where it is? No, 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 no. Yes, this one. And another way is to use symmetric security key. I'm not sure about introspection. This is pretty much concept of OAuth or even OpenID Connect. I'm not sure, but the symmetric security key is the easiest one to explain. So how it works? Whenever your authorization server issued or creating your token, it signs this token with this security key. Symmetric security key. Symmetric, not asymmetric. Why symmetric? Because they will be the same for the resource owner and authorization owner. They are not asymmetric. There is no private public peer. So you should keep it very, very, very secret. Like environment variable or something like this. And basically, authorization server uh, signs the access token with this uh, symmetric key. And whenever the resource owner it receives this token it gets the payload and signs with the same symmetric security key and if the uh, signature signatures are the same it means that access token was signed with the same signature and it is valid it can provide the resource owner information this is basically how jwt works like it gets the payload it is signed with some algorithm and the signatures are compared in that way you can provide a stateless validation of the token you don't need to go to any database you can but you don't need to you don't have to yes so we're gonna use basically this method and to use it simply just copy paste most of the time you will be copy pasting and refactoring this code this is like yeah this is open ID. this is how you can do cheaper, <laughs> not identity server. So let's say our resource server is called one, set issuer. Issuer should be our authorization server, which is 7000, this one, authorization server. Um, yeah, okay, nice. We add it, and now auto authentication authorization. And authentication, we are adding uh, OpenID Dict scheme because it knows it contains all necessary headers inside itself, uh, not headers, handlers to be able to validate cookies, access tokens, whatever. 
and we're gonna use authentication authorization for sure and 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 and, and. cool and let's create some uh, resource resource controller controller I will drop everything here. Uh, authorize. Okay, by default it will use OpenID Dixon. Okay. Okay, get. <coughs> and here to validate that we have necessary claims. User claims find what? Okay, okay, okay. What's the subject? No. Ah, come on. about it user HTTP context user identity name this should contain our ID right name of current user they will be how code to the, okay and we just returning okay with the string like the user the user and user so this way we ensure that we can get necessary claims right here. Good, 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 good. And did we add any like use when I did it? Yeah, another thing. Our client is going to be swagger that we will host from the same resource server. So what I would like to do is to have this green button authorize with client ID and password pop up. We click authorize, OAuth flow is performed behind the scene. And then uh, we can interact with Swagger as Swagger will include access token. This is what we're gonna actually achieve. And to do this, uh, we're gonna modify swagger gen in this way so let's add configuration at security definition i copy pasted this code to be honest because it's not related basically to ours it's about building our client something ah, okay yeah, 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 I'm mess. yeah so another thing I copy paste here is this one okay what's going on here 
I don't really know about how Swagger works and how it generates those scenes, but actually we are trying to say that we are going to use authorization uh, with OAUS to flow, which is well known protocol, with those endpoints that are pointing to our authorization server, and with this scope requested. So the scope should be requested to be able to to access this resource controller yes and um, later on we just gonna use this swagger ui in that way yeah we is client the web client and the secret that we have put in our cedar now let's create the particular scopes in our cedar so add scopes i'll just copy paste this seeding behavior as well so we're creating a scope manager uh, trying to get api scope if it's not null we drop and recreate it from the scratch this api scope will represent resource server one and this scope will be needed to be able to access resource server for all the clients and 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 and, and what else do we need to do yeah and we registered this scope for the client as well here in permissions cool now now since we put resource server one invalidation here, most probably that's it. Okay, let's try build at least. Ah, one more scene. Our direction endpoint will be uh, most probably swagger. because yes since we're gonna use our swagger as client our redirect url should be swagger OAuth to redirect because swagger should be able to get those authorization codes and exchange it for access token <laughs> okay now let's build and see what will happen next okay first error nice <laughs> how long we are streaming like a few hours already right nice let's first the startup project boom most probably we need to add migrations i think Client Cedar, oh yeah, Client Cedar wasn't re registered. Client Cedar, let's try. Created my database, like, but where are migrations? Refresh. Okay, do we have migrations at all? No, we don't have. Okay, it's maybe something related to entity framework. For some reason, we don't have migrations. <laughs> as far as I saw him, we don't have. No, we don't have. But it works. It's strange for me, but whatever. As you can see, we have default uh, UI, default Razor Pages UI, but also we have Swagger because we added controllers. No, we don't. How? How come? Oh yeah, maybe because of, I know Swagger. Sorry. Yeah, I know why. I know why. Swagger chain even 
No, we don't. Oh, even comma. Let's let's not care about it then. Okay, we don't have swagger in this case. But we should have swagger here. Okay, I will set up two projects to start simultaneously. Bam, play, bam, bam, bam. Start. Okay, nice. <laughs> We are almost finished, I think. Okay, Swagger Jason, what went wrong here? 500, don't like it. Ambitious HTTP mass for action resource controller get. Any description? Action require explicit HTTP mass body into. Okay. Oh yeah, 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 HTTP get, yeah, yeah, that's okay, that's okay, I'm gonna put a breakpoint here, please, yes, and also in authorization controller, we'll put breakpoint as well, first one, and second one. Okay, this is our resource server. There is already client. Uh, can I do like this? No, it, it is not copy pasted. Okay, it is already client ID uh, set and, and it's coming from this value. So let's try to include our scope, open the tab and uh, Authorize. Invalid scope. Scope is invalid. And what scope do we have? Scope API 1. It says that scope is invalid. Yes, and I know. Why? Because in program we didn't add scopes. Yeah, if you don't create your scope and OpenIDDict will not find this, uh, in OpenIDDict doesn't find this scope in its table, it will throw an error that scope is invalid. And that's good. This is a secure way. You don't need to care about anything. OpenIDDict will, will take over your like problems. Nice. Now we connect. Okay, we got the authorization endpoint. Here's the request with five parameters. Those are regular parameters for OAuth, like client, claims, some undefined claim. Uh, okay, it doesn't matter much. Parameters. Here it is. Response type code because the authorization code, client ID, redirect URL, which is like Swagger redirect URL, our scope and state for security reasons. First, we try to authenticate with cookies, but as you can see here uh, and here as well, 700, our application doesn't have any cookies, so it will return not authenticated and not succeeded result. Yes, succeeded false, authenticated false. Excuse Ah, okay, sorry, 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 this is my problem, excluding, yes, thank you. Once more, got our request, parameters now is five, the same as parameters. Ah, yeah. It's not authenticated, should be. My bad. Hey, come, come, come here. Yeah, 
that's why I like C sharp and Visual Studio. If not authenticated, we just throw challenge with our cookies, fill in the URL, and we should see our. Okay, 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 makes sense. You know why it is like that? Because whenever we register our authentication with cookie default scheme, the default value for login is this one because it's identity uh, pass, as far as I remember. So how to fix it? It's pretty easy, pretty easy. We can go to our cookies registration. Add cookie, boom, and see login pass. In our case, it is authenticate because we have our uh, razor page called authenticate as well. Let's try one more. Nice. Okay, we got to this point. Now we should go straight away to challenge. Yes. Nice. Perfect. What's going on? We got to this authenticate form. This one. What is pretty cool about it that Razor Pages automatically inserts request verification token. This is this anti-forgery token, which you would do if you generate your HTML on your own with pull backend. That's why I choose to use. Razor pages. This one will be validated as authenticated. So no CRF CSRF attacks are possible in that case. Or at least that not that much possible. Uh, and also oh, one thing I didn't do. One particular thing I didn't do. I would like those values to be auto populated. So come here and const email to not fill them all the time. Const password. Bam. Nice. nice again challenge boom what's going to happen next we submit it and whenever we submit it what's going on we got to this on post async we check that those are the same values we created principal claims and signed with cookies now our application should contain cookies yes and it really does like cookies and under forgery token anti forgery token to check the uh, CSRF attack and cookies is just our syndication cookies to be able to get the identity. Now, what's gonna happen is authenticated gonna return true. That's okay. We got the application. Application really exists with web client. We got we, we try to get constant claim from our principal, but as far as you remember, in authenticate method we put only email claim here. So. In this principle, we're gonna see only one claim called email. That's right. And if it's not equal to grant value, we're gonna return it to consent form. This is kind of not expected. Okay, let's do like this. By the way, the cookies are preserved. So now we don't need to authenticate once more because we, if we load application uh, for this one, we don't have because it's a resource server. 7002, it's resource server. But if we go here, bam. This one, why it does not contain? Ah, okay, it's blank. 
okay. We're not as indicated. It's strange, but okay, submit. Okay, now we're gonna be authenticated. Nice. And we're gonna have cookie set. Cool. Consent claim does not exist. Yes, now it is under authorized. For some reason, it uh, it couldn't read authorize uh, attribute with cookies default authentication scheme. But okay, this is our redirect. Uh, this is weird. This is weird. Anyway. If we get grant, we will be redirected not to the right place. Can we fix it right here? No, no, we cannot. Okay. okay let's try one more. Okay, let's go straight to this place. For some reason, cookies are not preserved. Why? Okay, okay, I have some thoughts why it could be like this, but anyway. Oh no, it's authenticated. Nice. It is. Pre they are preserved. That's good. It seems like. Okay, let's try to generate. Yeah, now it's connect. Uh, correct. Redo redirect URL. We type grant. And whenever we typed grant, it went here and added claim. Constant naming. Constant naming, yes. So now in these cookies, we have updated value. And. We again redirected here, authenticated true, consent claim now is not empty. Now our principle, as far as you remember, should contain two values, email and consent. And consent is okay, we are getting our user ID, we create a new claims identity, set all the claims, uh, for, 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 for open ID dict with roles and stuff. Scopes, and what are the scopes? Scope is API one, for sure, because it what we requested from the Swagger. Authorizations are zero, so we're gonna create new one like this with everything here needed, and sign in. Fail to fetch course policy. Nice. Yeah, we need to configure course as well for our case. Yes, let's do this quickly. This is also security stuff. So don't bother yourself that much. I'll just copy paste. Like this, so we are allowing course policy, and only region we allow uh, to use and to send requests to us is uh, our resource server. Basically, this is our client as well. This is our Swagger from where we're gonna uh, exchange authorization code for access token with any headers, and we're gonna use course uh, here. I think. Nice. Cool. Okay, now since we went through all the process. 
The cookies are not persisted. That's what I'm not happy about. But okay, we will we will we will talk about it later. Grand K. Okay. okay, now it tries to exchange the code for token, and this is the authorization code. We're trying to authenticate using OpenID Dict scheme, and it's successful because we signed in here. User ID is not empty because we set it before, we set in claims, bam bam bam. And this sign in with will issue tokens. And we most probably can see it here, right? Yeah, yeah, this is our token. Here, here it is. So we exchange this authorization code with this secret and stuff like that. This is our builder token with appropriate scheme. Now let's try to query resources. Boom. It's not correct because... That's interesting one. Uh, this one is a little bit harder to to check basically but let's take a look what could go wrong I know what's going on the thing is that we have registered this uh, security key in our resource server, but we haven't registered it in our authorization server, that's the problem. And also why my cookie is not persisted, this is what I don't like about it. So let's... Authorization call flow... Mm -mm -mm -mm. Here, here, here... This one... Now we registered registered it in, in authorization server as well. That's good. And 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 and. What else I would like to do is to check cookies. How do I register them? Just regularly. Nothing special. Let's start. Okay, authorization server started as well. Grant. Nice. Exchange, we're exchanging. Also, let it go through. We got our token. Try. Yes, yes, token was validated. The proof of this is our name claim that we can access in our endpoint and return it. That's it. That's basically done, guys. Our server in, I don't know how many time. It's like, yeah, two hours and a half. To watching right now it's weird but okay <laughs> yeah i need to work on subscribers <clears throat> anyway one more thing i would like to test this logout if we try to log out yeah 401 try to authorize again yes it does not prompt you again most probably it prompts you because the server is restarted i think there are ways to preserve it but we don't want to bother ourselves on it. So now it works. Okay, for the um, actual source code, uh, you can go. I will leave most probably uh, link in the description how you can fork this sample it is actually in this one OWS resource server and authorization server that's basically it 
I think we can stop now. So thank you for the attention guys. It was test stream. I don't know whether you like it, whether you don't. But most probably I will create article from this stream. I'm not sure. So thank you for attention and good luck.